here at Biomate. And we're recording. Uh, let me start the slides again. So, so again, welcome to everybody. We have a great turnout this afternoon. We're eager to get started and have uh, a couple of our project leads really show off what they've been doing so far. Uh, but a little bit about Biomade first. Uh, we are a manufacturing in innovation institute. We are one of 16 across the U.S. Uh, we were launched in 2021 in April. Uh, we are one of nine that the Department of Defense uh, underwrites, and you can see a number of our objectives here as an institute. We are focused on the bioindustrial manufacturing space. Our vision, of course, is to build a sustainable domestic end-to-end -end bioindustrial manufacturing ecosystem. It sounds like a tall order, but we can do it, especially with our project partners. We're excited to, to uh, really spearhead this work. Before we dive into the webinar, I just want to alert you to a couple upcoming here. We do have a series going on for education and workforce development. Currently, we have 10 projects uh, going, and we definitely want to highlight everybody's work here. So we've got one coming up in December. We've got one coming up in February. You'll continue to get information pushed out about opportunities to listen in on these webinars. And again, we're so glad that you could join us. Okay, so for today, again, I have a couple of projects, uh, folks I've been working with that I'm I'm really proud of them. They've done great work. First off, we'll kick it uh, we'll kick it off with Natalie Kuldell, who is working on this is one of her projects. She has another one, which she'll highlight next December, uh, focusing on partnerships for training in biomanufacturing with some of her high school students. And then David Blum will close us out out of University of Georgia and down in Athens, focus on uh, DIY bioreactors for uh, specifically community and technical colleges that can't really afford to buy uh, big, big bioreactors for their labs. So we're very appreciative of his work as well. Uh, some logistics here, you can go ahead and type your questions in the chat box. We'll be taking those at the end of the session. Uh, Natalie will kick things off for 20 minutes. David, the same, and then we can close out the day with your questions. So again, appreciate your attendance, and I will turn it over to Natalie to start. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. I hope you can see my screen, um, and I am really... Uh, just delighted to be able to have a chance to talk with everyone who's joined about a project that I am very excited about and very proud of. Um, you will see that it is a work in progress, and I'll be eager to hear your questions and your thoughts uh, about the work we are doing to train uh, biomanufacturing workforce in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. So um, this talk is divided into three parts. The main part is the center part here shown on this overview slide. Uh, it is really the focus of the talk of you know, what we are doing in Worcester uh, to build a high school biotechnology and biomanufacturing uh, certificate for those students before they graduate from high school. Um, so what it, what it is and, and how it's going will be the most uh, of my talk, uh, but I will bookend that with a little bit of um, uh, look ahead, what could be next and where this is going. And I'll begin by talking about uh, where it started and where it's coming from, uh, maybe trying to answer the question of, of why us, why BioBuilder as the right entity to try to build this uh, curriculum for Worcester. Um, and I will say that uh, this talk, um, I will start in a much more personal way than I traditionally do when I introduce BioBuilder. Uh, and uh, that is to talk a little bit about how I got into science and why it was important to me, because I think that that really motivates a lot of how we approach our teaching and our work we do within BioBuilder. So um, I will start by showing this photograph, which uh, was taken in 1997 uh, at the National Institutes of Health. At the center of that picture is um, my very first scientific mentor and very dear friend now, uh, Dr. Alan Peterkovsky. This was taken at the National Institutes of Health in one of their libraries. 
I see that picture and I can smell those books and I know what it feels like to be in that small space because I, as a high school student, got to work uh, in Alan's lab at the NIH. Um, you'll notice behind Alan there to his right is Marshall Nirenberg. And uh, this was just an amazing collection of scientists that I got to be around. And, and what was amazing was that they treated me as um, not a peer, but as somebody whose thoughts and ideas really mattered. Um, and so um, I will share with you um, a page from my laboratory notebook from way back when. I actually still have my laboratory notebook. This was my first laboratory notebook and I love it still. And for those old enough to recognize some of the way we I documented my work, there's a Polaroid there to document my gel electrophoresis that I did way back when of a digest of some DNA there. Um, but as I say, what was special about this experience really was that I got taken seriously as a scientist and that I could really contribute to something that was bigger uh, than just the facts that I was learning in my science classes. Uh, in fact, um, Alan very generously continued to include me on publications that came out of the work that we did. Um, this is one from 1991. You'll see it has both my maiden name and my married name on it, so way back when. Um, and uh, this experience was incredibly important to me. Um, and, and Alan made it that way. So this is a last uh, piece of this slide. Um, he is still a very dear friend of mine. I got the nice chance to reconnect with him when I was down in Washington a few weeks ago to give a talk. And here's what was amazing about that. Re one of the things that was amazing about that reconnection was that as we talked, all of the details that I thought I had forgotten or that I certainly don't think about very regularly, they were all in there. You know, the names of the people, the way we used to do things, the cadence of our work, all of that is still deeply buried in my brain. And I say all of that just to start by saying, if we can connect to high school students, young students, this next generation and, and give them experiences that are authentic and that allow them to see themselves in life science, I think we will hook them. I think we will bring them into the fold and, and not everybody, it's not for everybody, but we have to give it a chance, right? So um, this leads to BioBuilder where really our mission is to inspire students not only to learn about life science, which you can do from a textbook to actually love it. And some of loving life science is to see yourself in the future of life science. And so we bring science and engineering programs to students all around the country and all around the world um, that connects them with authentic practice practice and ways of engineering biology. We have programs for students, um, programs that are directed at educators and programs that are directed at industry professionals, as Louise alluded to. I'll be talking about a different program next time and I, and I will not run through the litany of programs that BioBuilder offers. I will focus on one today, which is our workforce development program in Worcester, Massachusetts. But I will also just before I transition, transition to that, mention that we do have an openly accessible textbook that was uh, published by, uh, by uh, O'Reilly and freely downloadable chapters on our website. Um, um, and then we also have kits that uh, students and teachers can uh, engage in hands-on science uh, in their classrooms and labs um, provided by Carolina Biological Supply Company. So lots of ways to get involved with hands-on authentic science. Um, our program in Worcester um, is a really exciting one, which is focused on workforce development. And um, to connect this part of the talk with the next part of the talk, I'm going to use um, uh, an analogy that I haven't used before. So maybe in the Q&A, you can tell me if it works or if it doesn't. But my analogy here is to bamboo. And the, the reason I'm uh, making this analogy is because I read something just this last weekend in this newsletter from Farnham Street that talked about how, um, well, you can read it here, but you know, if you were looking for a miracle moment, those moments where that secret ingredient suddenly comes into focus and uh, you can understand what, what you were lacking and that you make that transition to the next step. Generally, there really is no miracle moment and no single element that you're missing if you're focusing on finding just that one key ingredient. Really, when you see results, it's a chain. It's, a, it's the results of many steps along the way that were successful and that bamboo is nature's um, example of exactly that. Um, bamboo can take years and years to grow under the surface and you see nothing happening as those roots develop. There's no visible progress below the surface, but the roots 
and the storing of the energy are happening. And then when it is time, years of stored energy grow exponentially and you can get bamboo or see bamboo growing 50 feet in a matter of weeks. So um, I do believe that that is how results happen very slowly and then all at once. And so as we invest in high school uh, workforce development, I think we are investing in the root system of our future workforce. Um, and it's so important, right? Uh, the executive order on advanced biotechnology and biomanufacturing that was released a little over two months ago calls out the desire to train a diverse and skilled workforce uh, and to bring with it racial and gender equity and support for talent in underserved communities. That really will only happen, I believe, if we invest in that root system and store the energy in those communities so that all of a sudden we will see great success happening. Um, but it does take investment uh, in the roots. So the way we are doing this is to leverage a program in Massachusetts high schools called the Innovation Pathways. These are uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education supported programs that happen in high schools. And there are a handful of different pathways available to students. They are in uh, careers where there is a high demand for a skilled workforce. So allied health to become nursing assistants, advanced manufacturing, business and marketing, IT. The newest Innovation path pathway in Worcester Public Schools is the biotechnology and biomanufacturing pathway. And uh, to develop that pathway, they reached out to BioBuilder to help develop the two technical courses that are part of that graduation certificate, Foundations of Modern Biotechnology and Biomanufacturing and Applications of Modern Biotechnology and Biomanufacturing. Those are the two technical courses that we are developing with Biomade support. Um, I will just, as a placeholder, maybe for the Q&A, note that on this slide, Slide, you can see industry credentials are a part of all of these innovation pathways, as are college credit courses and workforce experience uh, internships and capstone projects. Um, industry credentials are um, a little meager in the biotechnology sphere, so um, I will just place that as a placeholder for maybe later discussion. Um, but as we look at the curriculum that we are developing for Worcester right now, the first of the two courses, Foundations in Modern Biotech Biotechnology, uses a bacterial cell that we can induce to uh, form an enzyme beta galactosidase at very high levels. And this inducible strain uh, to make an enzyme is something that they study both semesters. The first semester, uh, the first technical course they focus on uh, the re research and development aspects of this strain. So they learn to grow it aseptically, grow it in liquid culture, uh, on solid media. Um, they verify the structure of the DNA through DNA isolation, uh, restriction digest, PCR, and sequencing. And then they turn to the expression of beta-gal in the second half of the first course, analyze protein expression levels uh, with an enzymatic assay, column chromatography uh, once they lyse the cells and isolate the protein, uh, and SDS page for expression levels. So these are our key skill areas and techniques for research uh, in biotechnology and biomanufacturing. I have a very nice picture of our first cohort of students here uh, on the right-hand side of the slide. The second course is one that is just being taught for the first time this year. It's called Applications of Modern Biotechnology. The class relies on BioBuilder content uh, to teach bioengineering. How do you actually engineer cells to do novel things and uh, generate products that we uh, would like to see in the world? Uh, and then we also focus on this scale up of production. So biomanufacturing uh, through the growth and induction of this very strain that they studied the semester before, you using the SBI equipment that has been provided to us through the Biomade funding uh, and fellowship. So uh, the scale up of the strain that they had studied in the first technical course uh, is part of the second technical course. And throughout this entire technical course, they are also developing their own biotechnology projects, and that will help them uh, uh, have something to talk about when they go to interview for these jobs. You know, when you talk um, to students, they feel quite sheepish about not having content to, to feel strong when they go into an interview. And so these biodesign projects provide a template and a way of teaching them how to talk about science uh, and it's very useful interviewing skills for work. Um, so as an example of some of the work that we teach in the applications class, so this is um, actually this experiment gets taught in both classes, but I'll show you from day three, which is uh, 
day, I believe, or maybe it was Monday uh, for the applications class. This is an experiment in which students compare the uh, cell concentration, which they measure uh, in an over from an overnight culture using the spectrophotometer, so uh, light scattering to determine the concentration of cells as part one of their core of their lab work. Part two of their lab work that day is to carry out some serial dilutions of that overnight culture to test for viability. And so in this way, they learn the difference between a cell and a viable cell, a cell that can actually scatter light because it's in a, a liquid culture and a cell that could actually generate a novel colony um, in order to, to grow and produce something. And so they're learning sterile technique, they're learning all kinds of math, they're learning a lot of relevant skills. Um, and so that is one of the experiments that we teach over the course of this entire semester, uh, two semester courses. Some of the information that we're gathering from the students is gathered through exit tickets each time we teach them. Um, this is a question after the second day of the first class. Uh, we ask students, um, how do you feel about micropipettes? And most of them feel pretty good, although some of them still a little confused. Um, we ask them, what is a colony on a streaked plate? And 100% uh, of them got that right. Um, they know it is not a nation under a political uh, uh, sphere. So. Um, the math is hard. Uh, the math and biotechnology can be hard, and we continue to teach it throughout the both of the courses. If you ask them after two days, what is the uh, dilution ratio for 50 microliters of a solution in a final volume of 1,000? More than half get it right, but we're working on uh, getting that number up. Um, and then two just um, sort of more anecdotal pieces of information that we gathered from the students. What did you enjoy from these first two days of class? Uh, one of them said making the baby bacteria and using my pets. Um, being with classmates comes up and doing the lab experiments. Getting to be hands-on in the lab is really important to them. Uh, and then any questions or comments, the students, uh, one of the students said, no, I liked everything so far and I can't wait till next week. And another said that they're really excited for this class. So having them excited, having them hands-on in the lab, um, getting them to feel confident uh, as well as building their skills is uh, really vital to the success of this program, I think. So um, that to us is, is um, you know, as I say, it's a work in progress. We are continuing to refine the curriculum and make sure it's effective and uh, meeting the needs of industry in terms of the skills we're teaching. Um, but I will just uh, end with just a couple of slides about uh, talking about what is coming next. Um, I will uh, expand this analogy of bamboo once more to, to say that my new understanding of bamboo teaches me that um, there are two kinds of bamboo. There is something called clumping bamboo that has a very short root structure where shoots will arise from very near the roots that exist. And then there's something called running bamboo where the shoots, uh, when they finally rise from the ground, can range very far from that parental plant. And so in terms of next steps for this curriculum, I actually think we have two um, examples, one of clumping and one of running. So uh, the clumping example I will say is that the curriculum we're developing in Worcester is being adapted and adopted as part of another innovation pathway that is happening in Boston, Massachusetts at the Jeremiah Burke High School. Um, and we are working with them to uh, reconfigure the curriculum in order to uh, have their students at the Burke um, engaged in this innovation pathway as well. In terms of an example of running bamboo, uh, I am excited to say that uh, there is now interest in the state of Tennessee to replicate what we are doing with the innovation pathway in their own version of an innovation pathway called BioSTEM, and that's within the career and technical education schools. But it is uh, in structure and in spirit very much like the innovation pathway that we run in Massachusetts. So I actually think it is a short putt between what we are doing in Worcester and what we can do in Tennessee. And I think we are going to start uh, doing that within uh, the next few months and start to um, socialize the idea of bringing this curriculum uh, to an entirely new state and an entirely uh, new set of students. Um, and so with that, I'll just conclude by saying um, I am very grateful for all the support and all the collaboration that is absolutely required for getting something like this off the ground. We're very proud of the work that's happening in Worcester, and we have great ambitions for it as it spreads uh, throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and around the country. So um, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to my good friend and colleague, David Lum. Thank you, Natalie. Yep, David, you can queue up and jump right in. And we are getting questions in the chat, so it'll be a good discussion after David's pre presentation. All right, thank you very much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. 
Okay. Everybody can see that, hopefully. So, um, so as mentioned, my name is David Blum. I'm with the University of Georgia. I'm the director of the Bioexpression and Fermentation Facility, or the BFF, as we're known. It's a little easier to remember. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, one of our BioMade funded projects, which is the Bioreactor Education Setup and Training, or BEST project. So hands-on training is really tough to teach, especially for bioreactors. So the problem statement that I have here is basically that these bioreactor operations are critical for student success, but most community colleges, universities, high schools can't afford equipment because these systems cost anywhere from 30,000 to um, 100,000 or more. And so we've ran into this problem head on because of our need to train students. And so um, our unit is a biomanufacturing center. And so there are a number of these facilities across the US. The center in Athens is, as you can see here, is the only one in the Southeast. There are some centers that are uh, focused in the Midwest and yeah, there's one in the Northeast and a few in the West Coast. And these are um, large scale centers, but it, it really shows kind of the lack of, of infrastructure across the US. And this is really the problem that we're, we're trying to address. And so the bioexpression fermentation facility, what are, what are we doing? So we offer fermentation services, protein purification services, mammalian cell culture and monoclonal antibodies. And so I know we have a lot of uh, people uh, uh, from the public, so I'll just go through kind of what all these are. So fermentation, so when, you, when most people think about fermentation, you essentially are thinking about brewing beer. And so that's really not what we focus on. Although a lot of people are interested in that in, in Athens, we're a college town, so, um, but what, what we mean by fermentation is growing cells under controlled conditions. And so as you can see here on the right, this is one of our bigger tanks. We have a, a 900 liter tank. And so this is pretty rare. There, there aren't very many academic centers as, as you saw in the past uh, slide that offer these kind of services. And so um, fermentation is based where we're, like I said, where we're controlling the conditions and we are producing different products. It could be a recombinant protein. It could be a small molecule, um, alcohols, different uh, chemicals can be made in fermentation. The brewing of beer is, is also a process that we could run or making ethanol, and that is typically done under, under anaerobic conditions. But most of the time we're working under aerobic conditions. Um, some of the other things that we're offering here are protein purification. So once you make that protein, so the example I typically give is insulin. So insulin for, for many, many years had to be purified from animal organs. And so you, um, you could get about one kilogram of insulin from about 10,000 kilograms of organ. And so with recombinant uh, DNA technology, we're able to produce that at much higher levels and that uh, requires purification from your fermentation broth. And so you design your construct that gets purified uh, with the chromatography system shown here on in the upper right corner. Um, mammalian cell culture. So this is a little different than fermentation. So fermentation is typically used to describe growth of microbes. That would be bacteria or yeast. Mammalian cell culture are um, cells derived from animals. And then monoclonal antibodies, that's a, a, a offshoot of mammalian cell culture where we're producing antibodies that were originally discovered in mice. So in addition to offering these contract services, we also have a master biomanufacturing and bioprocessing program. One thing that I realized early on, I've, I've been at UGA for about 11 years now, is that when we hire people, they typically get hired away pretty quickly. 
And the reason is they get trained in techniques that are highly desirable. And so um, just before I joined the BFF, um, colleagues of mine established this biomanufacturing program via grant from the NSF. And so the idea is that, you know, workforce development is, um, uh, you know, really important. Our chancellor of our university system mentioned this multiple times in, in our annual report. And um, hands-on training is a critical part of the, um, the workforce development. And so our program, it has uh, academic courses as well as business and um, hands-on training. Um, we also uh, require students to do an internship. And we've trained over 50 students in the past 10 years, and many of them have moved on to industry jobs. And um, some of them we've actually hired on, and that, that helps us continue our operations as well. Okay, so our program was focused on this problem of, of having access to a bioreactor. The idea is that we are going to be doing what we call a do-it-yourself system. And we partner with several groups, um, including Albany State. So they're a, um, a college in the south region of Georgia. Um, Amherst, uh, Danimer are um, uh, biotech companies. And then we also partnered with uh, Community College, Solano Community College, as well as um, Cooner Shaker, Blue Sins, and Scientific Bioprocessing, or SBI, which uh, Natalie mentioned in, in her talk, as well as um, also uh, RAL Consulting. And so the idea around this project was to build a system from parts. And Blue Sins had developed the initial software, and they call this use what you have. I called it DIY because I, I kind of do a lot of home improvement. And so we, you know, that's a term that, that we use in that area. Um, so this DIY bioreactor, um, like I said, is powered by the Blue Sense software. We also are making what we call a souped up shake flask. So that's essentially where um, you're going to take a shake flask, which is used to grow bacteria, and we're going to add some features to it to make it more functional. And this part of the project, we're partnering with Cooner Shaker and Scientific Bioprocessing. In addition to creating these bioreactors, we're going to be developing, or we are developing, training tools to teach people how to use the bioreactor. And this would include uh, SOPs, case studies, question bank, as, long, uh, as well as educational videos. And then we also are doing outreach, um, workshops and visits to other campuses. Uh, so far we've had one workshop, uh, which I'll mention in a minute. And um, I recently visited Albany State and we had a uh, black scientist panel uh, discussing uh, careers in biomanufacturing. Okay, so many of you may not know exactly what makes up a bioreactor. So I'm going to go through some of those parts now. So essentially, when most people think about growing cells or tanks, you know, if you've been to a brewer, you may have seen some giant stainless steel tanks. For doing small scale production, we typically have glass tanks. So this is a typical tank. It's about five liters. And um, it's, it can be uh, used to grow bacteria, fungi, or, or mammalian cells. In order to power that system, you have a motor. So this motor sits on top of the bioreactor, and it does what's called agitation. It essentially spins an impeller inside of the bioreactor, and that helps deliver oxygen and mixes the culture. Now, the bioreactor here, uh, the image that I picked is from a company called Sartorius. The motor is actually from a company called Eppendorf. And so these two parts don't work together. So if you have an Eppendorf motor, you're, you won't be able to power your um, Sartorius bioreactor. And so um, that's a problem because of this interoperability. And we see the same thing with cars. So if you have a part 
for a Honda, it's not going to work in a Ford, so, so on and so forth. And so uh, what we're doing is we're actually 3D printing parts so we can connect different motors to um, uh, vessels from different vendors. All right, so other parts of the system would be uh, what are called your sensors. So sensors would include pH and dissolved oxygen. So when we're growing cells, it's really important to understand what's happening inside of the cell, inside of the bioreactor. So we typically will measure the pH inside as well as oxygen. Um, so what I tell my students is oxygen is really, um, uh, you know, taken for granted. You know, when, when we, you know, as humans, we breathe in, we breathe out, we, you know, you don't really even think about that. When you're growing cells, if the cells run out of oxygen, they can die really rapidly or it causes problems in your culture. And so the, the dissolved oxygen probe here can help um, detect how much oxygen is inside. And then the same way with the pH sensor, it can detect pH. Um, and so why is that important? What, what does a bioreactor do with that information? Well, we can create what are called control loops. So a control loop is essentially where the system looks at a parameter and it responds. So one example would be pH. So if you have a set point, so you're, you're telling the system, I want the pH to stay at seven. If you're growing your cells, typically they're gonna make acid. So that's gonna decrease the pH. So your pH could go down to say 6.9 um, as measured by your pH sensor. Well, your control loop can then activate um, some other part, which can be a, a pump, which can then pump in base to increase your pH. Um, so those are two kinds of sensors. Another sensor that's shown here, this is a, a level or foam sensor. So if we go think about the, the beer example, so when you pour your your glass of beer, you typically have this foamy part on the top, the head of the beer. So in, in our world, foam is really bad. So we want to try to reduce foam because what can happen is the foam can then cause the liquid to actually foam out if there's too much. And so the anti-foam sensor sits above the level uh, of the liquid and it can detect if there's a problem. And you have another control loop where we pump in uh, what's called anti-foam to uh, reduce the foaming level. Um, another control loop would be temperature. So a temperature um, that would include your temperature sensor or RTD probe. Um, the heat from the, so you have to heat and cool the system. So that would be um, regulated by say a heating blanket shown here um, in the middle. And then on the right is a chiller. So the chiller, would turn on if your culture got too hot. And so all of these control loops are really important um, for the operation of the fermenter. And then we have other um, equipment for our, our, um, our oxygen level. So I mentioned about that control loop. So um, for oxygen, we have um, what are called mass flow controllers. So what this does is it can take gas from an air compressor, um, or a cylinder tank if you have oxygen, and essentially goes into the controller. And then, as you can see on this readout here, the system can deliver the air at a certain flow rate. And so that, that changes over time, depending on how much oxygen is in your system. So all of those are super important. Um, this is an uh, example of a pump. Most of the um, the systems are going to have a, a Watson Marlow type pump. If you if you buy a, a bioreactor off the shelf, it's going to have a pump head like this. And typically, you need uh, up to four pumps or more for your system. So those pumps would be responsible for de delivering acid, base, and um, anti foam. And then for uh, some cultures, we do what's called a uh, fed batch. So fed batch means that we're feeding in a substrate and so that there's a fourth pump that would be re uh, required for that. Um, other equipment that is um, important um, for understanding what's happening inside of the culture would be an off-gas detector. So this 
unit is from uh, Blue Sense, so it detects oxygen and CO2. So it it helps you essentially balance the checkbook inside of your fermenter. And so with a fermenter, you have inputs, so you have the media, sugars, you have um, oxygen uh, that comes out, respiration, you generate CO2. And so the system can measure all of those gases and give you kind of a, a balance of what's happening inside of your culture. Um, and then finally, we have other units like um, biomass detectors. So this is a unit from SBI. So they have um, a sensor that can uh, strap onto the side of the vessel. And there is a, an LED that shines a light into the culture and a detector. And so you can measure essentially uh, what's called backscatter. And that is, um, tells you how, how many cells are inside of your system. And so all of these have to work together. So you have a computer system or what we call a supervisory control and data acquisition or SCADA that kind of pulls all this together. And so knowing this, we said, okay, you know, we, we uh, would like to take this on. And so, as I mentioned, we partner with BlueSense. They um, have a software called BlueViz. The BlueSense main product is an off-gas analyzer. So this is another, the blue and one is one of their um, off-gas analyzers. And so they developed the BlueViz software essentially to connect this blue and one to a computer. And at some point they realized, hey, we can connect lots of other stuff to a computer using BlueViz. And so now they've developed what they call the use what you have system. And essentially they um, um, can use this to build a system from different parts. So what you see in the picture here on the right, you have your vessel, you have a motor, mass flow controllers and sensors. Those are all connected to a computer that can display all of this information and so what we've been doing is working with them to fine tune this so um, the system itself is is still in development so we're trying to develop things with them such as how do you regulate temperature there's lots of different ways to do that how do you connect different parts so they're in europe so they have different mass flow controllers than the ones we have here in the u.s um, in addition, the, the bioreactor itself is something that we've been really interested in building. So a, a typical just to buy the bioreactor can be, you know, upwards of $10,000. And we said, well, it's essentially, you know, something that we could probably make ourselves. So I've been working with different groups around campus. So we have a glass blowing shop. So they were able, uh, if you see this image kind of in, just to the right of where it says blue sends, the glass vessel we can make in our glass blowing shop this metal part that sits on top we call that the head plate that can be made in our instrument shop and then we 3d printed this ring to connect the head plate to the vessel and then inside of the head plate you can see there's these threads so those can be used to install your your sensors and motors and all the other parts that are required for your bioreactor and so we've been um, really trying to play around with, with different ways to set this up, working hand in hand with blue sins. So I also mentioned this souped up shake flask. So this is where we're working with SBI. So their equipment um, includes this um, biomass reader, which they call the cell growth quantifier or CGQ. And then they have, um, that's shown on the bottom here. And then, um, and in the middle of the slide is their uh, liquid injection system or list drive. So what this does is it is able to deliver a uh, liquid to a shake flask. And so in that way, we can develop our own fed batch uh, methods using shake flasks, which are typically, you know, you know we're only able to do that, that in a bioreactor system. And so the idea that um, they have is to basically combine these to um, create a more effective system. And so they've developed this DOT software, which is actually um, being used now to do what's called biomass-based feeding. And so essentially what, what that means is you're looking at the biomass in the, in the flask and you're adding feed to kind of match the growth rate. They're also developing some pH and DO that we are 
uh, planning to work with them on integrating into our DIY system. And then with Kooner Shaker, they're making their own off-gas system that's for shake flasks. So Kooner Shaker's main business model is shakers. And so their system essentially measures the gas inside of the flask. And so we're combining the Kooner Shaker technology with the SBI technology into what we call this souped up flask. And so we feel like this will give you some functionality that'll kind of be in between um, a shake flask and our DIY system. So we're trying to come up with um, different trim levels. So if you, we go back to that car analogy, you know, you can, um, if you want to get from point A to point B, you can get there, you know, with, um, you know, a low, very inexpensive car. I'm not going to bring it. I used to bring up car names and people said, I have that kind of car, so I'm not going to do that. But you have, you know, a really inexpensive car or really, expensive car that has lots of bells and whistles and so you you kind of decide what you want to bring to the table and then we have this other option of doing this in shake flasks as well so in addition to that we're developing videos so um, previously I had a project with another manufacturing innovation institute called nimble and so we developed what i call the introduction of biomanufacturing where we went into a lot of the the kind of basic concepts. And so that course is available through our continuing education program, which I'll mention at the end. And so the, the content that we're developing now is, is a little more advanced. So these are uh, uh, work that we're doing with Dr. Mark Eideman here at UGA. And here we're focusing on things like growth rate, uh, different calculations, heat balance, yield coefficients, also uh, mass transfer, essentially how oxygen other gases get into the culture, oxygen uptake, um, KLA, which is re also related to oxygen, and then we'll um, get into uh, continuous culture and fed batch. And so these, like I said, they're all pretty advanced, but we feel like these are things that you, if you get a job at a biotech company, you're going to need to know. So we hosted a workshop this past summer. So this was workshop one. So the goal of this workshop was to deliver some of the content that I just talked about in the previous slide, such as um, understanding KLA, um, off gas. We, we got into um, statistics, something called design of experiments. We had um, uh, companies talk about sensors and uh, shake flask engineering. And we also uh, showed the attendees how to 3D print their own parts. And so in the upper right, this is our first cohort. Most of the, the folks here uh, were from um, the uh, community college um, world. We also had um, folks from SBI and Cooner Shaker, um, Blue Sense, and um, Hamilton, wh who make the uh, pH sensors. And so it was a really uh, great workshop. I'd never done anything like this. So I was kind of an experiment for me. And so I think it went really well. And so um, we are planning a second workshop next August where we're gonna focus on building our DIY system. We're gonna get more into the weeds on dots and, and, and other content. And so future directions of our program. So we're gonna complete the prototype bioreactor sometime uh, either end of this year, beginning of next year, we're going to complete all the videos um, and other content by the summer and then we'll have like i mentioned workshop two and then um, we are um, interested in getting additional funding for what we call uh, downstream processing so everything we've done so far with this program is what we call upstream so that's growing cells so after you grow the cells you have to process them and there's lots of things you can do that's a whole other talk but that's essentially called downstream training. So that would be things like separating cells with centrifuges, drying chemicals, chromatography. Um, and I've actually been talking with Natalie about, you know, potential for working with other high schools. I've um, worked um, through UGA. We have what's called the Young Dogs Program, where we bring in high school students that work in the lab. And I, I saw um, Janet Stanevin. She's at Lambert High. We've also um, work with a lot of her students, as well as students at our local um, high school. Um, 
and we've had other uh, students come from our community college the Athens Tech with Jeff Rapp who I see is in the in the um, uh, attendance as well so so that's that's the program um, so this is kind of my shameless plug part so I um, if you'd like to get more information we actually have a YouTube channel that has a lot of the videos so if you just go tinyurl.com and then mbb-youtube so this is our um, our YouTube channel where we have a lot of videos that we produced already and then that um, intro to biomanufacturing course is um, like I said that's offered through our continuing ed program so anybody in the world can take that for a fee um, we have a, a gene uh, uh, and cell therapy program as well and finally I'd like to thank Biomade for funding this and and being such great hosts today and uh, thank you for your attention Thank you, David. Thank you, Natalie. That was wonderful. And we're so excited about the work you're doing. Um, welcome back, everybody. I've got a number of questions in the chat, and I will go ahead and direct those to our project leads as they come up. Uh, feel free to continue to add your questions. Uh, for Natalie, starting off with Natalie, she'd like a question about how long are your courses and are they within their school their schools or extracurricular activities um, continuing Natalie how many students can be enrolled enrolled each semester how are they selected and then how is the opportunity advertised uh, thank you all all really good questions and thank you for asking because I uh, was the, it was the part of the talk that I trimmed so th so thanks very much so um, the innovation pathway that I described is a Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education program. It is implemented differently in different school districts. So in Worcester, um, it is a, a four-year program. Students are recruited as freshmen and receive college and academic planning classes. They begin the technical course in their sophomore year, so then they take the first technical course. That technical course is 15 weeks, 90 hours. They come twice a week after school for uh, about three hours every day, so uh, for twice a week. Uh, three hours a time. Um, and they come from the comprehensive high schools in the Worcester area and are bused to Worcester Technical High School, which has a lot of the equipment that they need for carrying out this work. Um, the second technical class that they receive is uh, in their junior year. At that time, they continue to receive career and academic planning. They are also starting to be placed into summer internships. And as seniors, they have time in internships uh, they have a capstone class if they choose, uh, and they also do dual enrollment classes or advanced uh, placement classes. So when they graduate as seniors, they have a certificate as well as uh, work experience and uh, advanced placement, advanced standing in college um, settings. Um, the students are recruited um, through the Innovation Pathway um, Coordinator, and so we really have, as I say, leveraged our partners to help bring students in. Interestingly, when we ask students why they are enrolled in biotechnology, almost all of them say, because my mom told me to. <laughs> so, um, getting the word out about biotechnology as a good career path and as a, a option, um, if they're interested in science, uh, is, is definitely part of the lift and part of the work that Biomate is helping with. Natalie, about how many students each semester? Uh, would you sorry, say? I, I missed that part. So as we are spinning it up, we constrained it to, I think nine or nine, six or nine, the first uh, semester. It is 15 this round through. I think that it can go up from there. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, 15 to 20 in a class is probably the capacity that we can run every year. Yeah, yeah, great. And is there any connection between BioBuilder and iGEM? Oh, yeah, we're friends. We're, <laughs> we love each other. Um, it's great. Um, you know, I view iGEM as kind of the Olympics for synthetic biology and biotechnology and Olympics. I, I love watching the Olympics. It's um, amazing to watch these uh, accomplished athletes, but you don't get the Olympics unless you have club sports and the YMCAs and things like that. So BioBuilder to me is really more of the community building around uh, how do you get more people engaged so that they can eventually reach these um, incredible dramatics uh, uh, that you see at the Olympic level. That's great. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, just to alert folks, I did put my email in the chat if anybody on, on the uh, Zoom call wants to reach out to me. Uh, I welcome any kind of connection. 
Uh, David, let's throw to you. Are there uh, are the parts and how to order them provided in your workshops? Uh, is there any interest from suppliers to bundle components to reduce costs? Yeah, that's a great question. So our workshop two is where we're going to be rolling out our blueprint for the DIY system. So workshop one was focused on, you know, a lot of off the shelf equipment like SBI's equipment. So workshop two is where we're going to be essentially, you know, going over all of those parts that I showed in my talk and, and essentially going through, you know, how do you actually piece this together? And so the, the beauty of the system is that, you know, you can bring parts from, you know, any supplier and essentially you're using kind of off the shelf equipment. Now, um, it's up to the suppliers whether they want to bundle things, but generally we have totally different suppliers. So like, for instance, our sensors can all, you know, the pH and DO can come from Hamilton and they give us a little discount. I think they went from 5%. Now we get a 10% discount, which was a huge, you know, deal for them. They're like, wow, you know, they kind of made a big deal out about this last week at a conference. But in general, it's hard to bundle things because they're different suppliers. And so what we like to do is to show people how to take their parts um, that they may have laying around in their lab and then repurpose them. And so that's going to be the biggest cost savings because we have, and I won't name names, but there are companies that obsolete equipment and they make it impossible for you to use that equipment. Um, and so we're, we, we'd like to do is to show people how they might be able to use that in the future. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, David. Um, I think either one of you could really answer this question, although I do think it's probably more directed at Natalie about hiring high school graduates into uh, biotech companies or biomanufacturing companies. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, there is a, a growing desire to have the young skilled workforce that can can be brought in to uh, to make the operations happen, to be you know part on the process side of getting biotech and biomanufacturing out the door. Um, you know, we we one of the partners on this project with uh, BioMade here is Twist, and they have described their factory of the future as needing you know tens of thousands of new hires. So um, I, I think there is clearly a growing demand for workforce at all levels, uh, including the high school level. I think what is perhaps lacking and lagging, let's say, is the awareness that students um, could get really great jobs in this field without having to go to community college or four year or get a PhD. You know, many students think that if they want to do science, they have to go to college for that. So um, there's a little bit of a, a push and pull in that, right? This uh, industry needs these workers. Uh, and then, um, yeah, if they can make it clear that workers are needed at all levels, uh, all educational attainment levels, I think there will be, um, it, it, it's going to be that bamboo shoot, right? Suddenly everything's growing, right? <laughs> Uh, David, any information around uh, companies in the area that hire high school students? I, I've seen more um, companies hiring out of the technical colleges. Um, I think there, there is a place for some high school students. I guess in, our, in my area where we're talking specifically about bioreactor operations, a lot of times you do want to have you know, at least a two-year degree to go in that area. One challenge I, that I, I talk a lot with the folks in the technical college world is that employers actually have a, uh, a preference or, um, you know, they're slanted more towards four-year colleges. And what the message I think that the employers need to hear is that the technical college do as good or maybe better than four-year colleges at preparing students for careers in biotechnology. And I think, you know, um, I think the high schools can get to that point. I think they're, you know, we, we have, you know, a lot more high schools and technical colleges, but I think as far as percentage of ones that have biotech programs, it's pretty low percentage in high schools, I would imagine. In Athens, we're actually um, talking about setting up a new biomanufacturing 
uh, track within our uh, career academy at our high school. So I'm really excited about that and, and working with our technical colleges. I think you have to pull all of these groups together because you're going to have, you know, certain unit operations are going to, you know, a high school graduate will be, you know, perfect for those. But then you may have some things where you need a, a PhD with 20 years experience to be able to run a certain project. So it's just really depends on the work that's being done. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, back to you, Natalie, uh, asking about expanding beyond Massachusetts and Tennessee, of course, do, does an infrastructure need to be in place for you to kind of kick things off with the BioBuilder uh, curriculum? Yeah. I mean, I guess I'll say that the infrastructure is in place, right? We have high schools, 25,000 of them throughout America, and biology or life science is a required course in, in most, if not all, I don't think all, but you know, it is taught uh, in some fashion in all of our schools. So we do have an infrastructure. I think part of the uh, pinch point is finding uh, educators who are uh, confident and uh, flexible in their curriculum to be able to include, if not all of this, even some of this, right? Um, we do have the goal of being in every high school in America. Uh, I think every student deserves an education that includes things like this. Uh, but, uh, you know, finding the talent and, and on one of my slides, I had the talented teachers who are delivering the content in Worcester. Uh, they come from, from uh, science lab. They're, they're trained scientists and they've been in industry and now they're teaching high school. So those are, are rare birds. Um, but I think, uh, you know, we, we can certainly find um, more than the three that I showed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, this may be our final question. We're coming up on our time, but um, David and or Natalie, any other, uh, any information maybe about apprenticeship and has that taken hold in, in the biotech uh, industry? Um, well, I can say my understanding is that that is more of a European model, that the apprenticeships really aren't very common here in the U.S. But um, again, you know, I talk a lot with the technical college folks. I mean, that's something that we really need is that kind of model, because doing, you know, this type of training, I mean, it can take you up to a year to really understand how to operate a bioreactor or purify a protein. And so having that that kind of model could be a really beneficial in the future for our you know, workforce development. Yeah. Hey, David, Jeb, one follow-up question here too. Um, concerning recruiting students, are you looking at their citizenship status, uh, countries of origin? There's a concern you know, about security and export control. Can you speak to that with the university? So our university has an export controls office. So I mean, we pay a lot of attention to, you know, what comes in and out of the university. And then also through our um, Office of Global Engagement, they vet any students. So if there's any issues, then that would kind of go through that office. So we, we're definitely aware of that. But, um, you know, anytime you make a, if you're making a buyer, I had to go through this where, you know, it, I mean, it can be used to make, stuff you know anything so you got to be careful um but you know um if you know if you have the right controls in place i think then you can do it safely so that's great thank you well again big thank you to natalie and david both for taking the time your presentations were wonderful we're happy that everybody was able to join us this afternoon we will keep hosting these webinar series to really highlight the good work of education and workforce development at Biomade. And again, please feel free to reach out to me. I think David and Natalie both have their information posted in the chat. Uh, but again, we wish all of you well. Uh, happy holiday season upcoming and definitely hope to see you in December for our next talk. Natalie will be joining us again and then we'll have uh, another partner of ours as well. So. Take care, everyone. Thank right. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.